Hello, everyone, and welcome to the show. Before we get started, I just have an important announcement here to make. Alex Hausen, our lovely co-host from the Mini Features, is getting a promotion today. Alex, you want to tell us about your promotion? Hello, everyone. Uh, I would love to, Sandy. Thanks for the delightful introduction. So I will now be your podcast host along with Sandy. I'm super excited to take on this new journey and get to talk to more people and have more time with them. So thanks, everyone. Thanks for coming along the journey. Very excited to move forward with the show with you, Alex. What are you excited about? for, you know, the podcast in life. Mm. So I'm excited to get to talk to people that I wouldn't necessarily have the opportunity to talk to. And in some ways, that's been kind of a benefit of the pandemic and working from home is virtually we can connect to a lot of people. Yes, absolutely. I agree. The benefit of this podcast, we've gotten to chat with an elixirist for an hour every week and learn something new. So That's been a benefit for us, and that's going to be a benefit for all of our listeners right now as we get back into the show. Welcome to Elixir Wizards, a podcast brought to you by SmartLogic, a custom web and mobile development shop based in Baltimore. My name is Alex Hausend, and I'll be your host. I'm joined by my co-host, Sunday Mient. Hey, Sunday. Hey. And my producer, Eric Ostrich. What's up, Eric? Not much. This season's theme is Beam Magic, and we're joined today by special guests, Jeffrey Mathias and Andrea Leopardi. Hey, guys. Hey, all. Hey. How are you guys doing today? Doing, doing pretty well. Just came off of a long weekend and diving back into work, but in general, just in a good space. I'm here. It's a nice long weekend. It's a bit warm over here. It's a bit a heat wave, but we're managing. <laughs> Definitely glad that you guys have gotten some rest. You probably need the recovery time, having just spent how many years writing a book together? <laughs> less, <laughs> More than less one. Than, less than 20. <laughs> a little less than three. It's, I think by this time, three years ago, we were talking about it or trying to figure out how to pitch the book. Or maybe even possibly working on like the the first samples of just how we could write, but it took a little bit of time to get things going. But by the September, it will officially have been three years since we actually started writing on we're like working directly on the book, and we're glad to be done. <laughs> how did you go about pitching the book? Where did the idea come from, and then how do you go about finding publishers? I can speak to the where the idea come from first. I have been working in Elixir since, I don't know, maybe like consistently professionally since about 2016. And one of the things I came from the Ruby world, I was pretty big on testing there. Just that's a big part of how I made my career. And I came into Elixir and it looked like it was a really cool language. I liked everything I came across about it. But there just weren't a lot of conversations happening around testing. And everybody kind of had different ways to do it. It clearly had like with XUnit being part of the main library, core library, like it clearly was considered to be a first class citizen But there just weren't a lot of people community-wise talking about it. And so I got the idea that I wanted to get enough experience under my belt that I'd be confident writing about it. The idea, if nothing else, is just to give people a starting point, a conversation, a place to have a conversation. You don't have to agree with everything, you know, everything that's said. But once there's a thing to argue about, then people will start talking about it more. And so I had convinced my brother who had written a Docker book for O'Reilly that he wanted to jump in and do it with me. But then uh, three years ago, I was working with Andrea, kind of mentioned to him that I was working on this. And he sounded really excited about the idea. And so I talked to my brother and I said, Hey, I think there's an Elixir core team member who might be interested in writing with me. And his response was, then stop talking to me. Like, just go get him. If he's interested, like, go for it. And so... Andre and I have been working together for a few months at that point. It's hard to remember that now because we've been working together pretty consistently you know, since then. That's kind of how it kicked off as I then came to him and said, Hey, so do you want to write this? And he said, I thought you said you were writing it with your brother. And I said, he told me to go away. Uh, like he told me that he'd write, you know, that it would be silly not to, to work with you. And so Andrea said, yes. Now, Andrea, do you want to talk about how we then pitched the book? Sure. So we, I think we kind of did a little bit of a try to figure out to which publisher to go with first things first. And then we approached Prague Prog because they are the ones that have the biggest Elixir collection. So like a book, the, the kind of complete set of books about Elixir. So we 
just I think we had to write a few things here and there to get the book going. Yeah, go ahead, Jeffrey. We you're skipping an important just... thing. Yeah, you're skipping an important thing. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because if anybody's listening to this, I don't want them to be like, I could follow this process. Step one, have an Elixir Core team member as one of the authors. Step two, ask Jose Valim for an introduction to the publisher that he's written for. That's Step three, to... <laughs> then produce a writing sample. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I just I'm not sure I should mention that because because usually you have to produce a writing sample as the first thing. So actually, Prague Prague has a whole process that you have to follow. So I'm yeah. not sure I should mention that I'm open to him, but I'm sure I should mention that like we were highly. <laughs> we still uh, had to write the... usable samples after that, though. We just kind of reversed yeah. the, the first two so, steps. But that's fine. I'll just um, mention like the the proper process, kind of, which is like to put together. You know, like yeah. we go on the on Prague Prague's website, follow their instructions on how to submit a proposal and yeah. stuff like that. And they're really good at that. I mean, they're actively yeah, soliciting yeah. ideas and uh, new book ideas from uh, folks who haven't written before. So if anybody's interested, they should definitely go check it out. Prague Prague has it pretty well documented how to, to go through the process on their site. You've talked a little bit about you know how you came up with the story for the book. But in the process of writing, you were essentially beta testing, right? So you came out with beta versions of the book and you'd send it to friends or colleagues or put it on forums or wherever and people would read it and give you feedback. I'm curious, how did that feedback shape the content of the book? I definitely had seen some chatter about your book on various Elixir forums. And I even saw like Jeffrey, you were interacting with some of the folks there. So I'm just curious, like, how does that change the content or influence the content or does it not? Jeffrey, you want to go or let me do it? Sure. I'm, I'm happy either way. Yeah. So Testing is something that we both know pretty well. We actually came in with very different styles, and but we'd been working together, you know, and then have been doing more and more so as time has moved on. And so we're largely set in how we suggest people test things. But that doesn't mean that we necessarily knew who our audience was or who we were speaking to. And so trying to figure that out was one of the biggest things. And one of the things that we got that we learned the most from the feedback, because there's also like a halfway review where you get feedback from professionals who are giving you feedback on the, the technical content of the book, as well as the writing. One of the biggest things we figured out was who our audience was. And it's basically anybody who is not already confident of how to test all the things, right? But there are plenty of people who are out there who are doing that. There are plenty of people who you know talk regularly on testing, but publish blogs, like it turns out we're probably not going to sway their minds if we don't do the things the same way that we do. We probably are similar, but we're not you know, the same. And then the other thing is just writing style. Uh, we learned how to be a little bit more neutral in things. And then one thing that did come up during our midway review is one of our reviewers was actually furious. I had in a rush just kind of written stuff down in one of our first chapters and didn't realize I was using without... I don't intentionally slip back into object-oriented terms on how I was just describing code organization and got some pretty strong feedback about that. So that was probably one of the places where direct feedback shaped the book the most. But the biggest thing I think was just hearing what people are struggling with and getting questions like that and learning to be okay. It was harder when we first started getting feedback, but now it's a lot better, a lot easier to deal with. Learning to be okay with people not liking what we're writing and not necessarily agreeing with us. And one, one thing I can add is that one thing that I loved about the reviews is that every comment is useful. There's no yeah. comments that are not useful because a lot of them point out stuff that's wrong or that can be explained better and they just make the content better. Uh, some of them just force you to address them kind of eagerly, right? Like you see this comment and so like, I'd actually don't have an answer for this comment or like, I don't know what to do about this, but I'm going to write that in the book, right? I'm going to write like, if you're wondering about why are we doing this? Like, I don't know, or like, we, we don't like this, right? But you just kind of, you use those comments as like questions that you're going to get if you don't write it down in the book, right? So that was really, I think that was a really good way that for me that like the comments uh, from Maria's shaped the book. So they, they were really all useful. I loved going through, through those. And almost all of it was really like coming from a very constructive place too, where people are just trying to help us succeed. And that was, that was pretty great. That I think also just helps you build the energy to keep going. Kind of just like in a code review, I guess, right? Yeah. All comments can be useful. So Andrea, you are based in Italy. And Jeffrey, I'm guessing you are not based in Italy. <laughs> I, um, I'm in Denver. Yeah. <laughs> from the so accent. what was the process like writing a book together, working together, working across continents, across many time zones? How do you make that process as effective as it can be? 
So Jeffrey and I worked together for a long time. So we had like a fair amount of overlap during work hours. I think he starts at my 4 p.m. is 8 a.m. And we more or less, and uh, I usually bring my day, like carry my day over to like maybe seven because of I've worked with the uh, you know US based companies for a while. We have a few hours overlap every day where we can chat. So it was not so bad. And when when going about the book, we tried to split up the work as much as we could, kind of produce content separately, and then maybe get reviews from each other. Uh, on the chapters and kind of try to make their voices more uniform and stuff like that so that we try to kind of what you would do again in like this asynchronous remote environment a lot of us work now right where you produce stuff maybe not necessarily together with other people but then you review it and you work asynchronously on it so much that kind of becomes a uniform i would say it was not so bad yeah, I think the big thing is that we kind of agree ahead of time what content belonged in each chapter, and then we split the chapters out. And but that way, we knew that we were kind of covering stuff. So for example, Andrea wrote the integration test chapter of the book, and probably would not have included much on XVCR if I hadn't pushed for that. But I think it's a, you know, it can be a useful tool uh, in the right system circumstances. And we wanted to make sure people knew about that. So like, that was my voice in a chapter that he wrote as an example. Cool. I mean, you spoke to it already that this asynchronous remote working environment, we've all found ways to adapt. I think it probably helps that you had already worked together. You kind of know each other's work styles. But yes, Sandy, do you want to ask a question? Yeah. So you mentioned having like chapters kind of predetermined and content predetermined. I'm curious how you decided like what methodologies to go with, because you both have mentioned that you don't necessarily test the same way or that you maybe have different styles of testing. Can you speak a little bit to your styles of testing, but also how you kind of came to that agreement on on how to have a unified message in your book? So I think one of the biggest differences between how we test is actually not obvious from looking at anything we write. And that's that I write my tests first. And Andrea, I think rarely does that. I'm sure there are situations where he does. But yeah, come on. What about a bug? I see you shaking your head. So I've never written bugs, so I'm not sure. I just don't write tests that other people. <laughs> oh, my mistake. It. My mistake. So, <laughs> so that's one of the biggest differences. And that we actually had a big discussion about before we wrote the book and ultimately decided that this wasn't a book about test driven development or not test driven devel- development. It was focused on the testing, like the actual structure of the tests themselves. And so I conceded that what we would need to do with our samples was actually show the code that we were trying to test, talk about what it was doing, and then go and look at how to test it. So it actually plays out backwards of how I typically, in fact, how all my code samples were written. But it doesn't really matter because at the end of the day, if I can look at your test and I can't tell if you wrote your tests before or after, then they're good enough, right? So that was one of the big things. And then the other one is that I think I'm just a little bit more uptight on like a level of just how locked down things should be to prevent regressions versus Andrea. And he's conceit like at least was when we first started working together. And he's come towards that. And I've learned to like relax a little bit as well. So effectively, our work style, because we work together, has adapted. Like the way we write tests at work has adapted a bit in response to us both kind of pulling on each other or pushing at each other in certain places. It was working together, helped us kind of figure out where our common ground was. But a lot of the content of the book too is, I think, shaped by our experiences in what it is that people test in Elixir. The stuff that the topics that we decided to talk about in the book and the ones that we decided that maybe didn't belong in this book were shaped a lot by, you know, years of working with Elixir where you write some you know kind of test you test you know phoenix applications you test acto code you test you know otp things like those are all things that we've i think all done working in uh, elixir and so that that was i think how we what we drew from to decide the table of contents i think or you know to have an idea of what we're going to talk about and admittedly that actually means that the stuff that deals with ui is less heavily covered and in less detail is to be honest, you know, the two of us are predominantly backend API, you know, developers. And so it's not that we don't have the skills, but at least I don't nerd out uh, about testing the, you know, HTML in the same way that I do. I get really excited about testing just about every other part of the application stack. So more recently, as of in the past couple of days, HBO had a little incident where uh, an intern sent an integration email, not in the test environment. So I, I was going to 
ask you, have you ever sent an integration email to everyone? But to turn that around, do you both have any good stories, examples of a time when writing a test could have prevented a bug, regression, an email, say? I think this is right before Andrea joined us at Community. But uh, the, the company we both work at right now makes it so that celebrities or anybody with a, a fan following can, can stay in touch with their audience via text messaging. And one of our very first people out the door, and in fact, we only had for about five month period or something like that, we only had a few clients, Metallica, Ashton Kutcher, and a guy named Gary uh, Vaynerchuk. Those were our first ones. But one day I was in the car with my family. We were taking the kids home from swimming lessons and Ashton Kutcher wished me a happy birthday. And I was like, oh, crap. Today is not my birthday. It jumped on Slack from the car. And sure enough, everybody had gotten it. And we realized that there was a basic test case where our code, if, if we had actually thrown effectively, probably could have been something along the lines of property based testing. If we had thrown enough crap at, you know, as in like that input at one of our, uh, at, at the way that we were filtering things, we would have realized there were scenarios in which it broke. It couldn't match the right filters, and it just grabbed everybody as out of the audience instead of being able to target people with a you know a specific birthday or a specific, specific location, etc. Um, and it came down to malformed queries. And so you know this this was in our earliest days where we were scrambling to get out the door, and we'd done this. But the fact is, is that we thought we had gotten pretty solid test coverage the whole way, right? So there's nothing like finding out that. And we actually revised the entire way we handled filters and handled failures because of that. But uh, Andrea, do you have any others? I don't have any stories that I can think of, but maybe I want to say maybe something not controversial, but that I really care about, which is that I love that email that went out because that email, I mean, first of all, it's fun, but <laughs> of course, but I really love about it that it tells me that HBO is doing integration testing so close to production that like that you can you know some, <laughs> probably some I hope that something small can screw up like so bad that like you know thousands and I don't know how many people get an email like that right so I'm a big 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 fan of not obsessing over automated tested everything I like you know end to end testing I like QAing I like testing in production uh, you know for a lot of things I think that's my Personal 80-20 rule, which may always turns out to make sense, is that like 20% of the effort writing tests, usually you cover 80% of the automated tests, right? Of what you want to test. And then you have to take like the other 80% of the effort to maybe try to cover that remaining 20%. And that I've often found that to be true. So I'm a big fan of like do something that covers most of it. And then sometimes it's fine to test in production, sometimes it's fine to deploy some code and just make sure you know, that it works by playing around with it. And that email just tells me that HBO is definitely doing something close to production, I think, because like they were able to actually send you know, to real people, uh, like a bunch of them. So they're doing like queries that get a bunch of people, I'm getting, I'm guessing. So they, they're using production data. I love that. I love that. Yeah, I can't go wrong. Every... But, uh, I mean, there's no, no such thing as bad that advertisement too, right? So I mean, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> every software engineer got that email and just smiled, you know, like we were all just, and yeah. you know, nothing, there was nothing wrong with the content. We knew what had happened and it was just like, ah, <laughs> I mean, give me a thousand of those emails out of the, rather than like the, the advertisement yeah. updates, you know, like I'd much <laughs> rather have that. Like I'm a bigger yeah. fan of HBO. Oh, that was, we don't yeah. get any emails, but <laughs> I think Sunday and I both have HBO related stories, but I just wanted to agree with you, Andrea, that I loved that. I thought it was great to know, but also that HBO followed it up with a tweet confirming that it was the intern and that they were taking care of them. We get so hard on ourselves yeah. when we mess up. And so yeah. to know that they're being taken care of, I think is it's a good reminder that everybody messes up yeah. and yeah. good companies will take care of you. Yeah, my story was mostly around just like, I loved the response to that response, which was just like this whole dear intern thread. And it was just like everybody's mess ups. And just like this whole chain of software engineers being like, dear intern, I messed up too. And it kind of reminded us all of a time where we could have like tested our thing better. And, you know, it's just a fun story. I almost think like, what's your biggest like testing mess up is a is almost a fun icebreaker for engineers. I was thinking, you know, Alex's question about, you know, what's the time that testing something better could have helped you? I worked at a travel company for a little bit and I actually booked a trip in production 
to Australia because I was actually going to Australia. I decided to use our company's uh, services um, personally, um, but we had never done international travel and time zones are the bane of all software engineers existence. And been, I yeah. was actually at the mercy of my own bugs. I was oh. getting Google updates for the wrong times. I was getting layover calculations that were incorrect. Oof. I was like, I'm getting on the right flight today, right? You know, I just wish I had known a little bit more about testing time zones back then. And that we could have tested out, you know, that kind of stuff a little better. Because the Australia one is is a big leap. Um, we were optimizing for like cross-country travel, not international travel at the time. Yeah. So I'm definitely thinking about how testing could have helped me out back then. Wild times. <laughs> Sunday, did you get on the right flight? I did get on the right flight. Okay, good. <laughs> um, that would have been that would have been a kicker to yeah, that. Yeah, luckily, luckily, Google told me that my flight was leaving early, not late. So it was like, hey, your 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 flight on Saturday is something something, and I was like, no, no, my flight's on Tuesday. <laughs> what are you talking about, Google? Oh. But Google had scraped the email that I sent wrong because I had built the email, and it wasn't like looking at the correct something or the other. So it was like <laughs> taking the email and auto populating the wrong timestamps in its reminders. And you can't fix that. You can't tell Google, hey, Google, you're wrong. <laughs> it's just a, not, when it's, wrong. not when it's scraping. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. it was a it was a bit of a time. It was a little bit stressful. <laughs> I made it to Australia and back though. No scrapes, no bruises. All good. <laughs> I, uh... And a lesson about time zones. Yeah. Well, <laughs> The second company I worked at, I came in and uh, they, it was a startup. There was a very, very small startup. We were doing uh, sensors and parking spaces. And I got there right at the time where they were actually starting to throw stuff up in front of customers and realizing they were having time zone problems all over the place. Uh, as Mr. Testing, because I had worked a lot with a lot of those people at the previous company, I right, gained that reputation. It became suddenly my very first thing at this new company was to to fix all of the time zone related bugs and welcome to the company, right? Uh, they claim it wasn't hazing, but that's when I, I realized that hands down the best thing to do when you are doing time zone stuff is to drop things one second outside of the correct time. What people tend to do is they will throw something into a different time that they're looking for for a record or something, because it's almost always around SQL queries that we see these bugs. Drop things instead of like safely into the margin of the difference of the time zones, you know, or whatever your query would be, always go one second inside, one second outside of whatever your boundary should be. Boundary testing, basically, and run it that way and use that to tune your queries. And it will make you... Hate times. No, you're still going to hate time zones. In fact, I developed a saying there that I can't even, I'm not going to say on the air, but about time zones and, and what we say about time zones. But yeah, they're terrible. <laughs> so, kind of shifting gears a little bit. So, one of the things I think that a lot of Elixir developers probably don't use but should utilize more is async true. How do we start using that better? I can try to answer. The thing with async true is that it's beneficial only on stuff that's like slow, because the easiest way to use it is to use it on a functional tests, right? Like testing pure functions, like no side effects. And you shove uh, async true there, and tests are not faster because they're already so fast that like making them parallel can't okay. kill. If anything, maybe maybe they're slower, right? For the context switching and all of the concurrency there. So. I mean, usually you want to think through where it's harder is, uh, you know, when you're testing side effects, when you're testing interactions with databases. And in general, with when it comes to Acto, the sandbox is pretty well built so that you can uh, use the thing async through and, uh, you know, get ownerships in the right places so that you can not scrap database things. For me, the hardest thing I've encountered when trying to use async through, trying to push for it a little bit, is singletons. When you have like singleton resources in your in your system that uh, you know are shared by the whole system, that is my really arch nemesis. In the book, I kind of like I have a section that I wrote about singletons, where it's like half of the sentence are like, "I'm sorry, I really I don't know how to do this better. This sucks. Like this, is, like, ignore everything that we that we said before. This is like not uh, a clean testing, but I have no idea how to test this stupid singleton in a good way. So it's always like compromises, and that's asynchronous cases are one of the things that make this harder because you have these resources that are shared by the whole application, and another one is also mocks and MLX, right? Or anything that's uh, that's on those lines for, for testing uh, 
um, for doing kind of um, dependency injection, uh, which is also Mox is a really good library. It supports you know allowances and ownership to for the Mox. If your code has clear enough dependencies between processes that you can do, for example, explicit allowances through Mox, or that you can do stuff like that and make the tests asynchronous, good. A lot of times you can't do it that easily. A lot of time, like you have this, uh, you know, the dependency injection happens at a, you know, more global level or it happens in process that you have no control over whatsoever. So that becomes a uh, harder to test. In those cases, I haven't quite found the solution, I think. So if you have yeah. ideas, I just wait more for the tests to run. <laughs> you know, step one is try to get an understanding of where it's easy, right? Which is the stuff that's purely functional. Step two is then learn a little bit more about the Ecto Sandbox because those are the places, especially if you're doing testing that's still kind of more unit testing, but it's incorporating the database. So, you know, your black box has expanded a little bit there. Those are still places. But as soon as you start integrating things, the complications tend not to be worth the payoffs. That's another good reason to emphasize trying to push code path, different code path and branching into places that even potentially are either either more functional or smaller and have a smaller black box and be able to knock out smaller tests there that also can potentially be isolated better, right? And then you can get away with using yep. async true. And then as you work up towards the controllers or the event listeners or you know the rabbit, the Broadway stuff or whatever, you're going to have more and more trouble, more and more overhead trying to be asynchronous. And so don't. Because at the end of the day, I'd rather see a slow test than one I can't understand, right? If six months from now, I come in, I'm like, why the hell is this structured this way? And it just doesn't give me any confidence in what's going on, then a slow test is better than that. Then the other one too is that for folks is you can do dash dash trace when you run your test suite and see the time it took to run each test too. And then that way, you can also just target those. Eric, I believe the reason you were asking about async true is literally so we can speed up our tests. The biggest thing is learn, you know, multiple ways to potentially identify and speed up tests. But that should definitely be one of them. And most people I know, myself included, don't use it enough or don't think about it enough until we're at the point where we have a slow suite. Can I one up Jeffrey on the dash dash trace, which is dash dash slowest and which is like much better to find slow tests. <laughs> no, trace new, I, isn't I it? Use, uh, well, like a few years. I mean. Yeah, okay. There you go. Just, I'm uh, stuck in my ways. There's a book. There's a book. There's a book you're, you can read. Yeah. Testing. But, um, oh, what's it called? Elixir test, Testing uh, and Other Good Things. No, jokes aside, there's a, there's a slowest, uh, that's the slowest, slowest and that's what I use a lot of the time because that really is like the, the distillation of, uh, of you ain't going to need it, right? Or premature optimization, right? Like you want to, sometimes you want to go and say, oh, this test is not a thing. I should make it a thing. Are you sure? If you do, like a lot of the times what I find is that there's a single test that are slow. It's not a, a whole test suit, test suite, suit, suite. Sweet. Uh, I never can run Jeffrey tried to teach me a kind of suite um, years ago, to, to be fair to him. Uh, so, but uh, it's it's uh, like a lot of the time I find that you run slowest and, and you have like, I don't know, a test suite of maybe a hundred tests and the five slowest one take 50% of the runtime of the test suite, right? So run that because, because a lot of the time you're going to be able to optimize a few tests and bring down, you know, like the, the, the runtime to, to like half, right? And then you go from there. And the, the test suites where you really need this thing through, I think are the ones where a lot of the tests are slow. Like when you're interacting with the database a lot, right? Those are the ones you want to speed up because you add the hundred milliseconds to every test or something like that. Then it starts to become like definitely starts to add up, right? And then you may notice though when it's a lot of IO. For example, a lot of file writing, you, you start to notice the benefits of async true. But it's all like dash dash lowest end is like, you know, a few characters away and give you a lot of insight from the test suite. Mm -hmm. It's so much fun to actually like get to pick your brains on these things. <laughs> so one other thing that we really wanted to chat with you about was mocking. Andrea, you mentioned mocks a little bit. I'm actually really excited that we're with this exact group of people because Alex here was the first person to teach me about mocks. I don't know if Alex remembers that, but I didn't know what, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Eric has reminded me that mocking is not a verb. Too much. <laughs> <laughs> I would have, I would have reminded you anyways. I was just like <laughs> biting my nails to say this. <laughs> so can you tell us what your thoughts are? on when to mock and not to mock. Can you speak to, you know, maybe why you chose mocks over other things or did you used to spin up your own mocks kind of substitute before you were using a mock suite? 
I'm going to jump ahead to why we use Mox, M-O-X, and then we can work through some of the other stuff there. The reason we use it is because it's just annoying enough to use because you require a behavior. You've got to do figure out some way to switch in your environments. It's just annoying enough to use to actually get you to stop and think, do I really need to use a test double here? And then the next step is you do have to think about that behavior. And it's the only library we've seen that actually forces you to define a behavior. It, behavior enforcement in an Elixir is not the same thing as interfaces in some other languages. It doesn't guarantee things are going to be perfect if you do that, but it gets a lot closer than anything else we've seen. And so you're in a place where you've got to define that behavior. You're thinking about that. And then on top of that, you know, I said it has enough overhead that you can stop it. It gets you to stop and think about other ways to get around it, which is great because if you can think of another way to do it, do. So for me, my personal rule for when to use mocks is to only use mocks in situations where you have something that you can't reliably control, or essentially you don't reliably own maybe, right? So the classic example is databases. Database, it's usually part of your application, you usually own it. And so having a mock for the database is not something I would do, because it essentially skips a, a layer of interaction between your application and, and the database that will be there. So, And you have control over the database, so you can do it in a reproducible way where you you know, set up the database in, your, in the way you want for your testing, and you can do, it, do that reliably. Whenever you have something that you have no control over, like an external API, for example, then that's where I tend to use mocks uh, way more. First of all, it's good to have interfaces on top of those things. And one thing that Jeffrey mentioned is that Mox uh, and Mox the library kind of forces you to think about the interfaces and boundaries of your application, which kind of defines the, the borders of the integrations testing. You know, like you're really knowing that you're integrating with something else. And you usually don't have control over those things, right? It's not only about the fact that in a log, for example, you're interfacing with an external API, they have rate limiting or they can you can pay for requests or whatever have you right and you don't want to do that in testing and also it's about reliability like uh, do you want your test suite to you know fail if the api you're using is having problems or anything like that right so that's when i tend to use mocks way more a caveat that i really like that kind of drive this point home of things that you have reliable control over is network interactions so for example when you're testing databases it's true that you own them but you usually do not own the network that your application uses to talk to the database, right? So in those cases, I like to use mocks for some tests where you use a mock for the database just so that you can test the failure cases of the network because that's a nightmare to test, but it's going to fail. Like it's one of those things. It's like it fails all the time in production. You All the time you have timeouts, you have disconnections, all sorts of things related to the network, to TCP or to UDP or whatever, but they are really hard to test because because locally everything is just you know usually just fine, so you never get any of these disconnections, errors, or, or timeouts, or you know long uh, long response time or anything like that. So that's uh, I really like to use mocks for that. That's my kind of rule of rule of thumb, like things you can uh, you you have control over. So to build on that, for example, if you have a purely functional module that is well tested. That is something that you've got control of and it's very predictable in your test. Like, do not try to, to replace it, that with a test double because there's no way that the return value when it gets called is ever going to be different from what you would expect it to be. But then on top of that, it's the same kind of stuff. If you've got code that is specifically doing an interaction with a database and, and that code is tested where it's got all the different branches and you're working on a module that calls that. So it's a, it's a step up in your dependency tree. There's no reason to replace that module with a test double. If, if what you're trying to focus is the logic in the, in the module that's a step up, then all you need to do is make sure that your inputs into that are going to make give you predictable responses out of that dependency. Typically a happy path and a sad path, right? Something like that. And so what you're looking for is, do I need to cover the logic in the section that I've added, right? As we continue to grow, in fact... Those who are actually seeing me on video right now can see that at some point recently, I was explaining these concepts and drawing black boxes and going up an application stack with somebody. But as you continue to back out from a coverage standpoint, the higher level you get, the more you just focus on testing the, the logic in the new part of the code that's not as tested, right? And so all you need is to make sure that the responses the dependencies give are going to be predictable. 
And chances are, if your database logic is changing, your whole application logic is changing. And so it's good for the expectations at a higher level to actually be breaking because you just, you just changed the behavior of that dependency. And that's what I mean by like looking for ways to get around having to use, use a test double. Just one quick thing about mocks that I'm really passionate about is that when you use mocks, you use them, for example, for an external API, you usually can't get away with just that. Like you still need to some way to test the actual interaction with the actual API. And that's exactly the 80. I want to talk about this because that's my 80-20 rule where you write a test, like an automated test yeah. suite that uses mocks in order to interact or... And not just mocks, right? Like anything that's kind of in that in that area, like it could be cassettes or you know XVCR or bypass to fake the request. Those are all kind of ways of doubling uh, as the dependency without actually having to to interact the dependency. All those ways, they're great for the, they they get you eighty percent of the way there because you are pretty confident your code's going to work. But you got to test your code somehow, right? For example, CI. If you can run against the real API in CI do that maybe in CI once a day if it's uh, if you pay money for that or even just deploy the code test it manually with a real thing that's the kind of last 20 percent where like you yeah automating it's going to be like real hard and it's not easy to reproduce and you have to do it on machines of all your developers and all of that but actually testing it you need still need to test it you know otherwise you're going to find stuff that breaks because you're using mocks in the wrong yeah. way or whatever right? so you, you're not predicting yeah. everything that can happen through the mocks You've mentioned this before in previous conversations that there's more to testing than just writing the unit tests and the integration tests. And I think you touched actually just now on a few of the different kinds of ways that you can go about testing. Do you want to speak to that a little bit, Andrea? Sure. My 80-20 rule, like that final 20, there's so many ways to achieve it that are not automated testing and that usually don't require a lot of the effort that would uh, that they would require to be tested in an automated way. I like to consider, for example, CI as a slightly different environment than, than your local testing, because in CI, you can do more reproducible stuff. You have like the same machine. It's always connected to the internet and so on and so on. Uh, so that's a kind of something that I try to treat differently. And I try to reserve some tests for CI, for example. And you also have, uh, you know, smoke tests where you like exercise your system from end to end as if you were, or like end to end tests, however you want to call them, but you're where you exercise your system as an external actor. So, for example, you have a you know a web app. You just have a headless browser tests or whatever, right? That just exercise the whole thing, but are not even part of necessarily your application or part of different services. They just live on their own. And then you have like engineers testing. That's a very fair way of testing things, right? Deploy the code and test that it works. I like that. I do that all the time. And well, you, you, do, you need to. <laughs> if in lieu of everything else, you don't have the ability to set up smoke tests, you don't have the ability like. The number one thing, you deploy your code, you run it, and you make sure it's working. And then you revert it, roll back if it's not. It's amazing to me how many companies I've gone to, people write great tests. And somehow, you know, we've, we've all heard it, right? Well, the test passed. Yeah, but did you try it? Right? And so nothing, nothing automated tests ever will do can be a replacement for just trying your code. And in fact, knowing your plan to validate it before you get out. And that doesn't mean you're going to catch every case. There may still be the coming out, but if it's basic functionality is not working, then you know you messed up. Yeah. Jeffrey touched on something like to make it very easy to roll back the code. That I can deploy and test and if there's something wrong, you know, roll it back so that I can I can really do production testing, right? And invest yeah. maybe the in the tooling to deploy quickly and painlessly. And that's something I find very, very valuable in that quest to not automate everything, but make it easy to do the very, the very hard to automate tests manually sometimes. I think we're all over here just like, yes, smoke <laughs> test your code. Woohoo! Seriously, <laughs> though. Yeah. It's a great reminder because, yeah. I mean, you're right. Yeah. I think also, too, there's a there is such a push. I'm not saying there shouldn't be. Write your tests, then write your code. Test all your code that you can get so in the mindset of doing test-driven development that then you forget to actually manually test your code. Yeah. So it's a nice reminder. I tend to see that skip step the most with people who test drive. It's not exclusively them. them. And to be honest, like I worked in this career for a little over eight years now like in this field. And I finally took down production for my very first time last November in a like hard to recover way. Thank you. And the worst part about it is, you know what I didn't do was 
jump through the logging after we, you know, I deployed it. I checked for errors, but I didn't jump through the logging, and there was something that was catching that was being caught there, and I took down production. And it was just because I didn't, I hadn't put my full plan together and looked at, you know, and, and done the follow up on it. So, and it was because I was in a hurry, and I was confident because of my tests that I had covered all the cases. So it was one of those nice things where I got to eat a little bit of humble pie there. Fortunately, we work at a company that when we make mistakes, as long as we're not consistently making the same ones over and over again, they tend to you know handle things really well. Work together, write a root cause analysis, figure out if there are things that need to be changed, and get out. And there's no shame involved, basically. So and then blame yeah. the intern at the end. Yeah, yeah. We 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 say instead of having a blameless environment because everybody knows who did what, we talk about shameless, right? Where we all make mistakes, and a lot of times it's our system or our processes that actually got somebody to think whatever it was was a good idea. So yes, maybe yeah. what we really need in life are T-shirts that say "I took production down on." And then, <laughs> and then you can really wear it like a badge uh, of pride. Yeah, we've all I'll, done I'll it. Start, I'll start working on the iron-ons. I'll, I'll get your address <laughs> and I'll send them to you. Nice. Amazing. <laughs> so speaking of things that you can hold, you know, t-shirts, books, you've got a book coming out any second <laughs> now. Are there any particular takeaways that you hope that somebody picking up your book at Target or Amazon, you know, picking up your, your book in person. <laughs> what do you hope this person will take away from reading your book? So for me, the biggest value, I think, is in, in having a point to start the discussion about testing. And I wanted to write this book also because I think that there's not uh, a standard way to write tests in Elixir. There's not, not a lot of guidance on how to write tests in Elixir. I hope things that the book can achieve is to at least be a starting point for discussing about uh, testing and more and discussing about what are the standards of testing. And admittedly, Elixir in particular and Phoenix and Acto, they do a pretty like a really good job, I think, at guiding people to testing things in a certain way through tooling, through scaffolding and all the things that we try to do so that we have people write tests in a certain way and is a good way. The community thinks a good way. Uh, but there are certain areas like you know, OTP, where I really like, I never came across, like I always learned on the field, right? I never came across guides or blog posts uh, or not enough, at least, right? Told me how to test things on, in OTP. And so that's one of the things I'm very happy that are in the book is like some guidance on testing OTP, which was really gained like in the field, you know? So I, I'm really happy that it got this into the book. So maybe that's one of the, the things that I'm, I would be very happy if people took away. I'm very, admittedly, I'm very scared because OTP has been around like as much as long as, uh, almost as long as me. <laughs> so I, I think there's people that have been writing tests on OTP, you know, when I, when I was a little kid. But uh, so hopefully they're not going to come after me. It's okay. They don't work in Elixir. <laughs> that's, that's, <laughs> touche. That's a good point. That's a good point. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you know, I've been around a long, a long time in Elixir's, uh, in Elixir's uh -huh. history. That's true. So. <laughs> if I could ask one thing of people beyond anything else is fail your tests. See what it looks like when they fail. If they do not direct you to the problem, then go at either change the way you're asserting. Almost every assertion thing we have, you know, allows a custom error message. Figure out how to make it so that the test gives you as much information as possible about what's breaking so that you future you or your teammates will thank you everything we're doing is effectively for you know regressions it's it, we have the most context that we have that we're ever going to have the first time we write our code your tests are there to help you when you've lost all that context and so i actually do part of it is you know i test drive so it's where i have to go beyond that so i know what my tests look like when they fail and i absolutely go and tweak the way that I assert things to try and improve that so that if somebody has to go put any debugging line to figure out like, you know, what field is mismatched on a map or something like that, like because they had to step outside of doing a normal straight comparison, you know, double equals comparison. Like if anytime somebody has to dive into a test and try to figure out what broke, you did not do them a favor. I like that. Well, Jeffrey, Andrea, do you have any final plugs, asks for the audience? Maybe you're going to plug a forthcoming t-shirt company, your new Netflix show. What have you? Oh, yeah. I had to um, say no to Netflix because we're too busy with this stuff. 
<laughs> uh, so I got a couple. One is that I'm on Twitter. Please feel free to follow me. My DMs are open. I'm at Idle Hands, all one word. All, and uh, you're more than welcome to hit me up for t- with testing questions there. I'm also active on the the Elixir Lang Slack, but I don't like that we lose our message history there. So I tend to try to push people over to Twitter. We'll be starting up pretty soon. I've got testing Elixir there. And then we'll be additionally starting to do a supplemental, like covering blog posts on the stuff that we couldn't cover in our book, whether because it was too niche or we couldn't agree on it or something else. Testingelixir.com will be up pretty soon. And I'll be using that as a blog to add my stuff. And then Andrea will be blogging in his own place. There's one other thing. Uh, if people are learning, interested in learning the process of test-driven development, there's actually a book out there. I'll try to make sure we get it in the show notes from a guy named Herman Velasco. And it's about test driving a Phoenix application. And I think that that's a good place for people to start. That's about the, the flow of test-driven development. But then you obviously should buy <clears throat> Testing Elixir from Prague Prague to, to learn how to, to fine-tune that information. Andrea? Uh, yeah, I can just uh, maybe mention my Twitter username, which is what you hide at what you hide, all one word, where I tweet stuff sometimes. If you buy the book, we'll be very, very happy and we hope that you will like it. And please, for the love of everything that is holy, do not send us typos because we can't fix it anymore. So <laughs> please, I beg. I love the ones in the reviews, but now it's just, it's just going to make us, make us feel like, uh, terrible about ourselves <laughs> i'm just kidding but this is like one of the weirdest things that like now we can't change it you know so it's i don't yeah. want to read this book because i'm sure the first thing i'm going to do is like open a random page typo i'm sure so are you refrain from the, tweeting uh, me donald news probably doesn't still do this but if you found a bug in one of his books or a typo he'll send you a check for like 10 bucks are you guys no, gonna have that we are not going to do that no but eric Maybe i hear that you've actually volunteered no. to do it right Eric will send you $10 for every bug that you catch. I mean, if there's anything that... uh, 10 Eric bucks, they're redeemable nowhere, but you'll feel good. Wait, is it a cryptocurrency? I want some. Sorry, terrible. Maybe they're they're redeemable for one of the eggs that Eric's chickens will lay. And it will be sent to you in the mail and no promises that it won't break. And that's all you'll get. Uh, The eggs may require (laughs) self-assembly. Only small bits of assembly. Also, regarding typos, if there's anything that I hope people take away from this, it's that you can't catch every error. So deal with it, people. Before we close out the show, we'd like to share another quick mini feature interview. A brief segment where we showcase someone from the community at a company using Elixir in production and how they're using Elixir. Hope you enjoy it. Hello, and welcome to the mini feature segment of Elixir Wizards. My name is Alex Hausend, and today we're speaking with Tracy Onim, software developer at Podi. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much, Alex. That was a great introduction. And thank you to you all for giving me this opportunity to be here at Elixir Wizard. It's really wonderful to have you, Tracy. And what your intro didn't include is that you are also one of the organizers for Elixir Conf Africa. Is that right? Uh, yes. I was given the role of communication to speakers. That's amazing. What has that been like so far for you? Oh, it has been an amazing role to me. It gave me an opportunity to network with many speakers from different parts of the world. And also, it gave me an opportunity to learn about the communication skills, which is required when reaching out to people. Absolutely, which is a whole different kind of side of this industry. I don't think that I thought when I became a software developer, I would end up being able to go to conferences. How did you become a software engineer? This was something that I gained interest while I was on campus. The first time I went to campus, I didn't know about this this career and how it is. But when I found out there's an opportunity of solving problems with softwares, I really got excited. So I started learning programming while I was in second year. And this is through my friends who were ahead of me. They were in fourth year back then. Yeah, that was in 2016, I can remember. So Java was my first programming language. And what got me excited is this friend of mine used Java to build a school system. So since something that was it was a theoretical idea to something that was a software that can be used to solve problems in schools. 
it was something amazing and that's how I started learning Java. It wasn't an easy path, but at least I got to use it in my fourth year project. And after that, I gained an interest of working in a software company. And after my fourth year, I started looking for an internship where I could improve on my skills in programming. You learned Java in school, maybe a more traditional path to becoming a developer. But how did you find Elixir? Actually, I found Elixir to be beginner friendly. So Zonin Podi gave me an opportunity to learn Elixir. And the reason why I can say it's beginner friendly is I joined Podi when I was very novice or very green in this field. I didn't know how to program with Elixir. And Podi gave me an opportunity to learn it by made me join the mob session and pair programming and also they encouraged me in learning elixir so and also being given projects to work on made it easier for me to adapt and to learn it i 100 percent agree about the beginner kind of friendly element i think that i was able to learn a lot of the standard bits and pieces of elixir fairly easily but especially because of pair programming which i think is such a great way to learn could you tell us a little bit about what podi does at podi we the major stack that is used is elixir and we have been able to build an amazing project to the elixir so recently have been working in this project which is a gaming application what the project entails is that this client had this idea of educating people on cybersecurity and he wanted something that can be fun while learning cybersecurity. So with this gaming application, part of it was cloned from Bruce Tetris Project, if you know the Tetris Project. So the part of it was cloned from it. So we used LiveView to build it. And with that, we got the opportunity to build something that can make it fun by while playing that this pop-up question on cybersecurity, you're educated on it, you can lose, you can win the game. So with that also there were contests on it and yeah, it was such an amazing project for us, which was also used at conference. That's super cool. I think any opportunity to help other people learn about a topic they don't maybe know a lot about, especially if it's in a fun way, it makes people want to learn more which is great. It's all, it's really what we want. Elixir conference in Africa just happened, right? It happened May 8th. How did it go? It was amazing. Actually being our first conference, we didn't expect it to turn out this way. So, okay, we are all first jittering about that, but the most important thing is that we got to achieve our goal, which was diversity. And we also got the opportunity to network and to bring different countries together through Elixir Africa. That's amazing. I'm really glad that you guys were able to have it and pull it off. How did it get started? I joined Podi that was in 2019, which was a bit late, but I can tell you the history of how this came about. So while Podi started, Elixir was not its first language, but through Agile Ventures, Podi came to realize there's this language called Elixir, and they started mobbing, having mob session on Elixir with Agile Ventures. Then through that, it built up this interest of coming up with an internal meetup whereby they can mob on Elixir. And while mobbing, they can build some client projects with Elixir. So through internal session, definitely you can't learn alone. And there was an interest of joining with other Elixir developers who had the same interest in learning. So with that, it came up, Monday meetups came up, whereby Podi with other members from outside had to always held Monday meetups whereby they can mob on particular topics on Elixir. Then after that, there came this interest whereby why not come up with webinars? Why not source out speakers from different parts of the world and let them speak and let them people join and also learn something from that. This also gave them an opportunity to speak and to join and see what other people are doing with Elixir. So with that, we realized that this thing is majorly done in 
Kenya. That's where the Ligza Kenya Stroke Beam Kenya came all about. But we also wanted, we also had an interest to know what about other parts of Africa, what have they used Ligza to do? What are the production projects that they have built with Ligza? That's how we started having an interest with other people from Africa. And we also realized that there's no Ligza Conf that was held in Africa or organized in Africa. And that's how Elixir Conf Africa came to be born and it was started. So we had to start something. I think that's amazing. Are you guys already planning Elixir Conf 2022 for Africa? Yeah, we haven't started planning, but we have said that Elixir Conf 2022 will be there. So we are in a small break, then we'll all start. That makes me so excited. I'm so happy that it came about and that it was what you wanted it to be and more. Uh, I think conferences really provide so many incredible opportunities for people just to meet people and hear other people's ideas and what they've been working on. Did you have a favorite speaker at the conference? Most of the speakers are my favorite, but the major three, Bruce was one of them. Then we have Francisco and Peter Ulrich. Tracy, it was so wonderful to have you on today. I think that you're incredible and like your work putting the conference together is amazing. Thank you so much for joining us. And to all of our listeners, if you or your company are using Elixir in an interesting way and want to come on the show for a mini feature, we would love to have you. Reach out to us at podcast at smartlogic.io with your name, your company's name, and how you're using Elixir. Elixir.